My name is Monk Rowe, and we're in the uh, the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. And I'm happy to have Joey Morant with me today. And I'm not sure how to describe you because musician doesn't do all of it, but you are an entertainer and a, a kickboxer, a, a kickboxer, and a bringer of spirit. Hello, amen. And you're a bringer of spirit. And amen. I also, I also know you're well traveled because of your hat from My, Japan. from Russia. Just got back from Russia. From Russia, okay. Yeah. I'm a black Russian. All right. I love it. That's what they call me. Well, yeah. welcome to Hamilton. Um, you know, I had this thought this morning when you were playing in class. I never got to hear Roy Eldridge live. Oh, Lord. But from the description, I thought of you. The way Thank you, you. The way you play. Thank you, sir. Yeah. It's an honor to hear that. Because yeah. I've heard that before by, from Billy Eckstein's son, uh -huh. Ed Eckstein. And still alive and well in a record company. Roy Eldridge. I knew his daughter very well, too. Okay. Carol, before she died. Well, what is it that... Uh, can you tell me what you think about when you play a solo? When I improvise? Yeah. Jazz. Okay. Because I improvise R&B and gospel. Yeah. When I improvise jazz, I'm thinking how fortunate it would be if the young people, especially the minority, I want to underscore that because they they came up from the back of the line, the blacks, the Hispanics, some Jews, if only they would reflect on their structure, life structure, and music when they start to improvise. Tell a story emphatically about what makes them unique as a person in spite of the conditions, not because of conditions. Mm -hmm. So I think of me as being a little boy who sold a watermelon back of a truck in Charleston, South Carolina. I sold apples and oranges. Get your apples today. I mean, like a typical little black sambo at that time. You know what I mean? I said typical because it's, you were expected to act black back then. I call it acting black. Oh. Get your watermelon today. No, we have some watermelon, ladies and gentlemen. You buy, not that. Get your watermelon, like Judge Gershon said. Get your watermelon today. And uh, I sold Christmas trees. I was a hamburger maker, BLT, pig in the blanket, which is a hot dog wrapped in cheese. Um, so I did uh, culinary work. I cut grass with a sling long before I got my hand on a lawnmower. Then I got a lawnmower that was not electric. Push, pull, push, pull. Then I finally graduated to an electric lawnmower. So I did a lot of menial work when I was little. And happily so. When I improvise, I see me as being a humble kid with humility who never blamed anybody for anything. I don't care how black I was, I don't care how white you were, none of it matters. Only thing that matters is the moment, the psychological, philosophical, spiritual moment. What I'm doing in that moment, and when I was dishwasher in a Honey House restaurant, Charleston, South Carolina, I never thought, oh Lord, why me? I never thought, Lord, why me? And even today, too many kids, especially the black ones, are saying, Lord, why me? Why not you? Pick up the pieces. Like the average white man said, pick up the pieces. Well, when did the trumpet come along then to replace those menial jobs? Uh, when I was uh, 11 years old, in, in, uh, what grade was I? Maybe fifth grade. Because I started school at seven, not six. Yeah. Back then, six was the starting grade for poor people. There was no kindergarten. For most people, they couldn't avoid it. So they started at six. But I was sickly, very sick when I was little, so I started at seven. A year behind my original class. My high school class, 1957, but it should have been 56. See? However, uh, God has helped me to kind of make up for some of that. And I got a, a leaky trumpet out of the attic in the, high, in the elementary school in Charles, South Carolina. Henry P. Archer school. That was the name of the school. And uh, my seventh grade teacher uh, introduced me to the trumpet in the attic. Just, you know, things that people left behind for the little black school in Charleston. It was leaky. You know, when it leaked, you got to blow harder because air escapes. Mm -hmm. So I tied it up with a handkerchief, took it home. Um, and uh, I, I really wanted to play the saxophone. I, I, I wanted to play the saxophone. Because the guy who introduced me to music in elementary school played sax. 
My greatest love for music at that time was the saxophone. Why I didn't play it at that time, I couldn't afford the mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. Mouthpiece back then was $6, I had $2. So what I did, I bought what was available, I bought on John Street from Bruce uh, Music Store, a trumpet mouthpiece, a brass, and I started playing the trumpet. What kind of music was being played in your home? Uh, mostly gospel and R&B, 78 records. Mm -hmm. Ruth Brown, when she was young, uh, Mahalia Jackson, uh, um, the lady who recorded Fine Brown Frame, who was a delegate in the Union Local 47, um, Nellie Lecture, Fine Brown Frame, I wonder what could be his name. Um, she also recorded a song called My Mother's Eye. I'm going to have on a CD, I'm going to give you My Mother's Eye is the name of the song, a standard. And I recorded that on my latest CD, My Mother's Eye, and a tribute to mothers. Nellie Lutcher, who had a hit record in 48, who ended up being a delegate in the Union, Local 47, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So I picked my, my samples from things in the air. I, I used to, when I was sick in the hospital, I went to the hospital a lot. And they had the metal poles in the bed, where you know, run your hand up, and it made music. Yeah. Remember those? Yeah. And that got me into wanting to hear some classical music. I didn't know what classical music was. I didn't know it was called classical music. I just heard I heard successions of, of beats being played in my head. And, then, and uh, interimly, I would hear some music like that. I didn't know what it was called. Mm -hmm. So I came up dirt poor. Dirt poor meaning as poor as you can possibly get. And as black as you can possibly get. Jet black. So that all the disadvantages were there, except, except that my mother God rest her soul, taught me how to love spirituality, the church, at that time, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So I went, I grew up in the church, Sunday school, they call it Sunday school, we learn about the Bible, Sunday school, and right after Sunday school is regular church service, which starts at 11 o'clock. After church service, you may have prayer meeting for the real church goers, then there was night service, so I was in church all day Sunday. So that kind of blessed me and taught me about music also. And what kind of music did they have in your church? They had Negro spiritual. It was called Negro spiritual. Precious Lord, take my hand. Uh, old rugged cross. Um, uh, uh, softly and tenderly, Jesus calling. Um, you know the things in the hymn book, okay. mostly hymn book songs. But ninety percent Negro spirituals, who, which has its roots in slavery. From humming. Did people sing in harmony? Um, well, other than Gregorian chant, which I which I learned to like, <laughs> uh, the harmony came out of the fields, black folks. Mm -hmm. But but in church, when they sang the hymns, did, did people find they find their harmonies? Yeah, they find their intervals. Yeah. Like precious Lord, I know how they did it. Take my hand, lead me on. That's the sixth. Let me stand, I am tied, one chord, and we six, I want five chord, da da de, major seven, de de de, minor four, de de de, de de da. I don't know how they knew it. Take my hand, which is one, precious Lord, five, lead me on. How they heard that, I don't know. It's got to be intrinsic, it's got to be like osmosis in the blood. Nobody taught blacks how to harmonize. But in Africa, nobody taught them either. Have you listened to Africans sing? Mm -hmm. Ethiopians? They automatically sing the right interval from one note to the other. How is that possible? I don't know. Did it's they create harmony? Yeah, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, I find in me, I found I can do things most musicians in the world can't do. Even some of the people you know. Like, no lesson, no formal training, nobody. I can harmonize with any song, in any mode, in any key. Pentatonic, Phrygian, Mixolydian, uh, uh, Lydian. I'm going to jump a few years here, but I, I wanted to know why you um, chose to join the Marines. Uh, challenge. Just strictly a challenge. Really? Same thing in the Army. Hmm. It's a challenge. Uh, I always wanted to be, uh, as this weird, I always want to be a hero. 
Hero to me meant somebody who was way above everybody else for whatever reason. Uh, when I was a little boy, I wanted to be a fireman. I thought they were heroes because of what they had to do better than you to get the job done. So the guy who was left standing was the hero. That's my definition of hero. Everybody else was just people. The outstanding ones were heroes. That was my definition. So from that I wanted to um, uh, be outstanding. That's why I loved the military. That's why I studied the martial arts. Because I wanted to be special. Not looking down on anybody else. I want to be better than the next guy. You know, I ran six miles a day, six days a week. And kickbox all week. But in the military, isn't part of their goal to make you less of an individual and more part of the group? Less than an individual in terms of your ego. But they mellow out, your ego gets mellowed out to stand out among the crowd. They, they reward people who are better than the other, but not at the expense okay. of the other, like musicians sometimes do. They want to be stars at my expense. Why should I allow that? Mm -hmm. You know, I feel I'm just, you know, it happens all the time. It's standard procedure in show business. Wait a minute, I got the answer. Well, maybe the answer is already said. Maybe you don't have to say nothing. Maybe the other guy already said it. So let him have it. Don't erase his image, his space, he just said it. So you don't need to say nothing. That's what we need to learn to do as commercial artists. I've learned it from the martial arts discipline. How not, that's why you know it's today, I didn't do a lot of talking. You don't need to, the bad director has it. I don't need to prove to you how much I know. You'll sense it, you'll feel it, you'll find out. I could talk all day if I wanted, and then that rehearsal, why? Half the suggestions that were made was already made by the guy conducting the band. Mm. So I don't need to prove to him that I know. There's a way, there's a mellow way to participate with students and grown-ups alike without taking charge. Because mm -hmm. it ain't your show. <laughs> you follow me? Yeah. So you have to pick your spots. Like every time the director says something, don't you say, and let me add to that. <laughs> you don't need to add to that. <laughs> A that bothers me a lot. Yes, yes. That bothers me a lot, really. I'm happy knowing what I know, who I am and what I am. Uh -huh. I don't need to prove it. You'll see it eventually. Yeah. If I can do my thing, you'll see it. I don't have to tell anybody who I am, where I went, what I do. I can write a book. That thing, more than anybody on that bandstand. But I never, I'm telling you now, you're interviewing me. Mm -hmm. You never know it. Mm -hmm. Was there a, a, a gig in particular, uh, when you were young, that really set you on your path that maybe you said, wow, I can do this for a living. Mm -hmm. The Metronome All-Stars, Charleston, South Carolina, they were, it was a group um, of musicians that was led by a school teacher who played upright bass. His name was Leroy Chisholm. I didn't know he was a principal. I knew nothing about anything. I was just a humble kid moving along hoping to give him one day to the next. But I found a lady, he was a principal, school principal. And uh, he had a band called the Metronome All-Stars. Had a lady in the band at the black YMCA. Everything was black and white back then, by the way. Everything, even the toilet, the sink, the uh, whatever. This was what year then? Oh, hell, 1951, 52, okay. yeah. 53. The black YMCA on Cannon Street in Charles, South Carolina. Leroy Chisholm performed one night. And I drifted over there because I knew the saxophone player in the band. He had a black female trumpet player, uh, Ray Carter, from the Sweethearts of Rhythm. What's your last name? Ray Carter, C-A-R-T-E-R, -E okay. from the Sweethearts of Rhythm. Remember that band? Yeah, the internet. All-girl band, right. I heard Ray. She, everybody drifted into Charleston. She happened to have been to Charleston. I heard her play. Play tenderly, like that, breathing with control. I don't know why I paid attention to that, but I paid attention to it. I'm standing in the doorway of the YMCA. Da, 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 da. I don't know why that got my attention. Something in me wanted to be where she was, sitting in that chair up on stage, while I stood in the doorway. 
When I went to high school the next day, the saxophone player who was teaching music, who was in 12th grade at the time, he's four years ahead of me, said, man, you sound like Ray. So I went to the band room and I copied it. Mm -hmm. The next day, mm -hmm. while he was there, Malcolm Hodges, who conducted the band in, in, in uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia, he took the band to, to the White House with Jimmy Carter. He's an he's a expert band director, marching band, doing uh, things on the field, superb educator. He said, man, you sound like Ray. I went, what a diddy. And he heard me do that. That's all I did. So he sounded like great. So he introduced me to the band I read. And I became one of the members of the band without knowing anything. I could read. I know nothing. But they carried me along. Okay. You said that this morning. You said um, it's about songs. And it makes me think that you heard that song and had that impression on you right back then. Yeah, that's right. It's about songs. Um, I think we're all a psyche to a degree. You are, your wife is, everybody's a psyche. They just hadn't tapped it yet. You have to be a psyche to have a brain. The brain, the way it vibrates, the way it generates um, protoplasm, the way it generates uh, 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 juice, dendrites, you know. We're all a psyche. We just hadn't tapped it. When I was a little boy, because of my father, I could read people. Minds, I can read places, things, I can just about tell you when something's going to happen. And how? How do I know that? Nobody told me. My sense, my antennas were always way up. That's what helped me in kickboxing. I always knew what the God was going to do in front of me. Always knew. Always knew seconds before he knew. So music helped me do that, I believe. Music, if you do it right, if you pay attention to your heart, to your mind, to your soul, if you do it right, leave your ego at the door, like Quincy Jones said. If you do it right, your psychic phenomenon, your psychic thoughts, your psychic uh, dribblings will come out of you and help you to know what normally you would not have known. You follow me? Help you to understand why we act the way we do and to forgive. Like, if I see somebody that's really stupid, I try not to put them down. But maybe they don't know they're stupid. That's what they are. Like, a frog is a frog. He, you know, you don't know he's a frog. So what you have to do, if you become a real good psychic, real advanced in, 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 um, in that kind of uh, 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 mental technology, then it becomes your responsibility to understand others, to understand that they know not why they do what they do. So your other job also is to help them get on the path so that they do understand. So your relationship with people, you're not supposed to tell them what to do. Show them what to do. Don't tell them nothing. I, want to, I don't want to teach you what to think. I'd like to teach you how to think. Well, that's what they do here in Hamilton. <laughs> that's funny you say that, because they're, they're, that's almost like one of their slogans. They, oh, really? They try to teach you how to think, yes. And the, God some of the alums will say that. Very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very important. I'd take a bum out of jail on death row. Give me two years worth of my change of life. I really believe I can do it. Even though he has certain impediments embedded in him. Mm -hmm. if, he, if, if I can grab him, keep him two and a half years, I got it. Mm -hmm. I got it. Well, you have a long resume. Oh, big time. People you, that you've played with. Is there someone? Fifty-five years. Is there some one or two people you pick out from that that really um, maybe taught you how to think, changed the way you thought? The Carolina Stumpers. You heard of the cotton picking Stumpers? I know you have Carolina cotton picking Stumpers. Mm -hmm. That's a different man. Out of that came the Carolina Stumpers, Frank Flood and the guys. I was 14, probably, in 1953, or 13, or whatever, when these guys were already in their late 20s. And they showed me how to, um, what's the word, another word? How to contemplate, how to regurgitate your, the moment, your, your, your space, spatial temporal space, like space sitting in now. And how to really be critical of yourself enough to move on. 
not to go back. See, when you're critical, when you learn to be critical, now you know how to be critical. Now what you're going to do with it? Can I either take you forward or take you backwards? Because that's the highest point in reasoning. You learn to be real critical. That like critical thinking, you read a book. No two people read the same book alike. The one that's most critical in the right manner becomes the most progressive, takes the most step forward. Others either stand still where they are or they go backwards. So I learned to think from the band leaders who challenge my being. One guy said to me one day, you know, that's not good. And that's not right. I didn't get mad. I was happy he said that. Mm -hmm. Today somebody said, oh, what do you mean? The attitude problem, I solved that years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I played a boat ride in Charles South Carolina, the Metro, and I'm all stars. I couldn't read nothing. I didn't know nothing. The guy had to call a guy who just died two years ago, who, 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 who was a trumpet player, left hand, Bob Ephraim. These are Charleston people. Had to call him in to get on the boat to play the parts that I didn't know. And he let me take the money. He didn't take the money. They, at the end of the night when they paid for the boat ride, he told Leroy Chicken to give me the money. I didn't know nothing. And so I learned to read out a combo arc, or arc, combo arc book. Maybe come on. I know, I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So, and then I learned the Latin book too. I know that's how I built my repertoire. You know, Charmaine, Maria Lena. I know all, I know at least 5,500 songs. Go as far back as you want. Ethnic songs too. Greek songs, Irish, Italian, uh, Russian songs. Mm -hmm. I'm the only band that goes to Moscow that play Moscow nights at the end of concert. And they start dancing the aisles when I play that. But I wonder why the other bands don't know it. Either they didn't care to learn it, never heard it before, or it doesn't matter to them. So through all of the questions you ask me, you have to learn to care. I care about you. I look at your office, I see character. I'm, you made me happy. Just stepping in the room. Well. You can't be happy unless you see, feel what I feel. A lot of people come in here, they see books, picture frames. What I see is intrinsic in the air, and the, and the mold is in the room, it's in the bricks. The room is an animal, it has a head, a body, arms, tail, legs, feet. Ah! That's from, heavy. Pra from a practical point of view, what's it like, I mean, music, is an up and down business. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And when it's well, up most of it is up and down, by the way. Yeah, that's true. M music takes yeah. its toll, though. What's it, what's it been like to make a living as a musician? Good for me. Yeah. I never experienced a, a, a real downside. I had times when I didn't work. It didn't bother me. Because the psychology in my nature took me to another job. I made the right phone call to the right agent at the right time, impressed him in the right manner to get the right job. Hallelujah. Another musician may be a hell of a player, but can't do that. I just call guys and pretend I was my agent. I have this trumpet player. He's very good. He's a great guy. He happens to be black, and he needs a job right now. You won't, you won't be sorry you did. You'll be glad you did. Give him a shot. Give him a job next to him. I did that with Harold Cutler in, uh, in uh, Ontario. Many times. I put Hank Jeff over the phone back then, the black and white phone. And I told him, I got me work like that. Other times I call the agent myself. And I sold me. Once they see me, the rest is history. That's how I learned to be an entertainer from a guy named Shotgun Kelly. He knew how to get on stage, make any stage work, rather serious jazz, serious classical, pop, Dixieland. I guarantee you, you can show me 100 musicians in the next 10 years who can do what I do with any stage on the planet. I don't care what the combination of attitudes, songs. I can go from James Brown to Miles Davis to Dizzy Gillespie the right way at the right time in the right place. You close your eyes, you think all those people are there. Now, if that ain't hard to do, let somebody try it. Is it hard to find musicians? To keep up with me? Yeah. <laughs> Real hard. You knew my question. Yeah, well, I suffer like that. That's part of my suffering. Ah. I put up a side. 
I band leader and kind of player coach, I teach. Mm -hmm. They were talking with Shovel. I couldn't sell a lot today, but I don't want to. Uh, they'll look at your video. I couldn't sell a lot out there today when they were talking. I chose not to say that. Yeah. I chose just to listen. Right. Um, because most of the players I've met, I had to kind of either directly or indirectly teach them. Mm -hmm. Like you were talking it, about before. Huh? Even the Holland Blues and Jazz Band. Starting the year 2000, Al may not tell you, but I can tell you because I know I got proof. They would not have gotten work in Sweden and Denmark without me being in the band from 2001 to now. Hmm. Even now, I'm supposed to go on tour with them. I can't go because I'm going to be in France. The guy is really upset because they didn't book the tour soon enough for me to be with them. But I walk on tables, I walk on the bar, mm -hmm. and, and still play. Yeah. Do whatever it took to get the band back. They got a lot of repeat business. I wish I didn't have to tell you this myself, because it's not known. In fact, one time, I had to take a plane every day to get back to the Hollywood and Jazz Band, because I was double booked. Oh. I can't do it this time, because I didn't have time to plan it. Because the guy was going to cancel the whole tour when he found that I couldn't be there. Boozer Steinheimer. Mm. God, the, the Al uh, knew. So I took a plane every day so that they can keep the job. Wow. This time they had time. I let them know a month ago I couldn't make it. So they found somebody else. So when you go overseas to France or something, you go over and appear with a rhythm section that they put French together. French musicians, yeah. yeah. That I approved of. Uh -huh. And I happened to be working all of the days that they're working. If I'd known in time what was going on, I could have staggered it. Yes. So I could meet them. But I'm going to say this again. If you, if you had time to do research, you, I can get name the play you find out. They would not have gone back to Europe right away, or Japan, or China, if I was in that. Mm -hmm. Not because I love me, because, but because they saw what was going on, how I carried mm -hmm. the band. I'm going back to entertainment. I carry the man in such a way that you can't deny them a repeat performance. Had they just played good music, just been good guys, I wouldn't have done it. Because I knew the promoters. They were, yeah. they were hard nosed, some of them. Yeah. They wouldn't have done it. Okay. So since 2000, 2001, since 2000 to now, I made all the tours, and I literally carried the band so they can go back again. You do that by having a multitude of experiences to project out into the audience with the help of the band. You know what I mean? Like I incorporated the band in everything I did, but I made sure I stood out enough to give them a reason to bring us back. Well, people like um, Lionel Hampton and... I Cam learned from him too. Cam Calloway. Were, Cam Calloway? They, were they people that you learned from? Big time, big influence. I know uh, 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 Cap Calloway's grandson. He runs the band now. You know that, don't you? Mm -hmm. Cap Keller Orchestra. Lionel Hampton, uh, he used to call me Bubba. Like, you know about that. Everybody was Bubba. No. But Gladys Hampton ran the business, his wife. You know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Shotgun Kelly, man who never became known, Shotgun Kelly was a cop in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. But he was a drummer, a show drummer. Taught me how to play drums. I'm a drummer also, by the way. I've taught many drummers. Uh, how to be a show drummer, play between my legs, behind my back, spin the sticks. It's like Lionel does. I learned that from Shelker and Kelly, before I met Lionel. No, right after I met Lionel. Okay. And, uh, and Shelker knew how to get on stage, do a dissertation. He could speak at random at any audience. This is when it was hard for blacks to do, 58, 59. Blacks are in now. Back then, to be outstanding, you better be good. If you're dog skinned. I mean, you better, you better give the white people a reason to want to sit there and watch you. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why should they? So I, I can thank God I had the, the best training school in the world. I never studied formally except for one semester. Yet I studied Hummel's Trumpet, Hyde's Trumpet and Chatter. I know Trumpet's Holiday, Flight of Bumblebee. Um, I took it upon myself to learn the technical. I'm showing you boys on stage for one minute. You may not have heard that. One guy couldn't do it at all. I showed him in 20 seconds how to do con, do con. How the back of the throat is your other tongue. Uh, yeah. You learn to use that. That's how you double tongue, triple tongue. You only have one tongue. 
The other comes from the throat. Coo, coo, coo. Yeah. So I showed him that in 20 seconds. When you, when you see a chart and it's got, you know, minor 7, flat 5, sharp 13s and, and all that, does, do you pay attention to that? I pay attention to what I know it means. In other words, if I had diminished chord, right, any diminished chord in any shape or form, I hear an emergency, like, like, like movie writing, you know. Ah. I hear somebody tied up on the railroad track and the train's coming and he's going to get destroyed if someone's not tired. So I see chords in terms of um, idiomatic existence, like I hear had a major seventh as somebody who's getting ready to leap up, leap somewhere. He ain't going yet, but he's going. Major seven. You follow me? Mm -hmm. A minus six is is um, is anticipation. That's why one six four five one became the doo wop intro. Uh -huh. Ba do do de ba do do de. You know that uh, do do de. And they do whole songs like that. They just change the name. So one six four five one became songs, many millions of songs, until the guy came along and wrote for the Drifters, under the boardwalk, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I was in his bedroom before he died, in his hospital room. Remember Linda? What was his name? Uh, a white guy too. They thought he was black. Big white guy. What's his name? Not Doc. Doc Bones. Yeah. 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 He just that's right. He passed away. I was in his hospital room every day to see him. And everybody thought he was black. Some people take the assumption, they assume he was black. They just assume that. As if to say, oh, somebody black got to do that. Not necessarily. Like he wrote Jerry, all the hits. Like Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller. There you go. I knew them too very, very well, yeah. See, so uh, there's so much you can learn about life and man and his world. Like this Silverado, you know that? The what? This Silverado. I got to mail him this. It's a, it's a piece of prose that was written by an airline pilot, unknown airline pilot, became a master to read, masterpiece, the Sonorado. Okay. He can pull it up, can he, Linda? Oh, yeah. Spell it for him, please. D-I-D-E-S-D-E-R-A-T-A. -E oh, okay. I may know what you're talking about. Yes. Mm -hmm. I would give that to all my students okay. for them to read every day, uh -huh. just all the blue. So you can see, having been uh, impressed with law enforcement, mm -hmm. that's one of my greatest loves also, because of my father. Music and psychology. Psychology and philosophy, I love. I'm married to it. That's my wife. That's my other wife. I'm married to psychology and philosophy. I made straight A's in philosophy and logic. Why, I don't know. You open a philosophy book, I got you. And you can get A students out there who are lucky if they make a B. Because they don't get it. We had an open book exam at the University of Hartford. Open book exam. And the best student made a C plus or B. I made an A. So that tells me something about man and his world and nature. Why are you making an A in chemistry, biology, you can't make an A in philosophy? That tells me, that answers all my questions. <laughs> You're an imaginative man, I think, and it makes me wonder when I when I see the you know there's a famous uh, jazz improv method called anyone can improvise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know about that. <laughs> Do you think that's true? Um, we're improvising all the time. We improvise like I'm sitting in a chair. If I pull my coat, it's all improvisation. If I clear my fingers. You improvise all the time, maybe not music, mm -hmm. but, it, but it's what you do in music. In music, you fold your arms, you cross your legs, you just straighten out your knees so you can relax. Um, you think about your wife, if you've got a girlfriend, you think about her too. So it's all improvisation. When you want to turn it into music, now it has to gel the one musical definition. So that's when your character, you have to be able to control your character so you can push it out through the concept phrasings of the song. Like, from the bottom of my heart, dear, apologize. No, we call that, but next time. Mm. 
And this is it. I apologize, the link stand. Mm. Um, so, everybody can improvise if they either figure it out the way or you show them the way. Because when I was growing up, white musicians didn't play jazz that well. Not because they couldn't. Not because they couldn't. They, had the, they were in an environment that didn't condone it. They said whites can play R&B and funk. Well, whites are some of the funkiest players there are today. I mean, how do you get it? Was this Mike, Michael McDonald was not the guy? Yeah. Was not the guy? Mm. Oh, Lord. With that raspy voice. Michael McDonald. Michael McDonald and the other one. Yeah. The other guy. <laughs> See, well, you wouldn't Bolton. get that. Huh? Bolton. Michael Bolton. You wouldn't get that in 1951. No chance. What happened? They discovered how to improvise, how to make, make it work. They paid attention. They paid more attention, and blacks paid less attention. So it was like this. From 1951 to now, whites got more intuitive, blacks became less. I can prove it. I don't like the way most black musicians play today. At all. <laughs> And they wouldn't like it if I say that, but I don't care either. Yeah, and, and you know, if you notice, uh, there seems to be more white musicians taking up jazz and blues yeah. than black musicians. and doing it well. And why is that? Well, because of assumption theory. <clears throat> the blacks, up-and-coming blacks, assume they got it. They don't have it. They assume it's a given. Oh, we know that. We don't know. Only thing to stop me from being an expert reader, which I'm not. I don't know anybody who is in and then that's John Favis. I didn't have the money to study. If I had the money to study, I would have been the Wynton Marcellus of the 60s. Mm -hmm. I had one guy who wanted to teach me, he had a car accident, became really disabled. So it's about opportunity meets faith and talent. Opportunity. Wynton had the opportunity, the faith, and the talent. And he developed the work ethic. Otherwise, he'd just be another guy. But also proves that anybody can do it. Why can't you do that? Same tongue, same body. You have to be taught how to do it. Yeah. So blacks fail to realize whatever worked for the white man can work for him from the late 70s on. My mother's generation understood that. They understand, don't get mad, get even, educationally speaking. But the blacks who grew up in the 80s, I'd say the 80s up to now, they have no clue. I'm not saying we're born, I'm saying grew up. If they were 15 in 1980, they still have no clue. When you graduate from college, blacks are still in the dark. I like to do a lecture one of these days, full with mix, a mixed audience here, and tell them exactly what's on my mind. Whether they like it or not, doesn't matter whether they like it. What matters is that they can't prove me wrong. See, nobody's doing those kind of lectures anymore. So that's another reason why we're lost. Nobody's telling like it is. The guy who made this jacket, Al Jackson, he said, tell it like it is. He and uh, uh, the late um, Jack the Rapper of Atlanta, Georgia, real light-skinned DJ to help black DJs because he was light-skinned like Adam Clayton Powell. So he got in the door. Mm -hmm. But I was begged to just start doing lectures and motivational speaking. I could have made half a million dollars by now. Couldn't make up my mind when to do it. Mm. Someone had 30 years ago to do this. Because of the way I talk, the way I project, it's both funny and real. And I can make you listen, whether you like it or not. That's what you need. <laughs> no one ever accused you of being shy. You don't get in the way like that. <laughs> Bill Gates wasn't shy either. He seems like an introvert, but he can't be but so much of an introvert to get the way he is. He was under, under the radar. Who's Bill Gates. That? Bill Gates. Oh, right. Okay. He don't seem like an aggressive mm -hmm. uh, extrovert, but he's got to be inside, otherwise he wouldn't be where he is. Right. <laughs> Do you think it's been a good, uh, you know, jazz in the last 20 years has been lifted up as an art form. Now it's in all the universities, and, you know, there's 
a huge business <laughs> yeah, that's what it is, a of teaching jazz. It's a business. You've got a lot of people jobs. They didn't get me one yet. Maybe I should apply. Uh -huh. I've been offered. I've yeah. been offered. Do you think it's a good thing that that's happened? It's a good thing 50-50. 50-50, yes. 50, no, it's the Eddie Condon of it. 50-50, yes, 50-50, no. Because a lot of new people um, have misled at least a quarter, a quarter out of 100%. Uh, of people, mainly the white people have been misled by what what jazz was, is, and should be or will be, by by the pseudo teachers who think they're teaching it, but they're really not. They're really not. First first thing you don't do, and I, your boy gave me credit for this today too. Doctor, what's his name? He gave me credit. He gave me. He didn't mention it today on stage, but he gave me credit today for bringing up the church. Yeah. I start. That's why I started talking first. No one's going to mention it. Because I'm dead serious about that. I think we need to learn where the blues and jazz, as far as that genre of music, really um, gave birth, came from. And the reason a lot of people avoid the subject because they don't want to talk race. They don't want to talk black. But you, you've got to speak racially in some sense in order to get to the truth. I can't tell you the truth if I'm going to avoid talking about slavery. If I feel you're self-conscious, I'm self-conscious. Well, how can I really tell you what you need to know if I'm busy trying to avoid that? A lot of younger blacks, a lot of, young, a lot of whites too, they back off what they, what they should come on to. So the church is very important to understand. Like, I, did, Were you there when I told them about New Orleans? Yes. Well, Charles, South Carolina should have been the jazz center of the world. No, they decided, they decided to push slavery, cotton and rice. Mm. So like I said today, I bet you a million dollars, you can't find 20 black musicians who would have brought that subject up today. I don't care where they graduated from, okay, how good they look, or where, where they were born. They would have brought it up. They don't want to offend anybody. That's not your concern. Mm -hmm. If I offend you, that's your problem. I'm telling the story. Mm -hmm. I hope I offend you. Maybe you'll pay attention. Yeah. So I'm saying, so New Orleans took over because the merchants promoted jazz. They promoted it. The Creoles promoted it. Charleston let it go. Mm -hmm. I was born in Charleston. Mm -hmm. That's my only regret. I wish I was born there. Right. So I had to wade through all of that water, like wading in the water. Yeah. You know? They concentrated on cotton, plantation, and slavery. Somehow the music culture tries to survive. Thank God. Because of the Jenkins Orphanage. You know heard about the Orphanage? Daniel Jenkins Orphanage? No, no, look that up. That's your assignment. Look up a study on Daniel Jenkins Orphanage, Charles, South Carolina. Jabba Smith came out of there. Ken Anderson. Uh, oh, most of the great trumpet players, you know, have passed through the, orph the Orphanage in Charles, South Carolina. And you're going back there very soon. Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow to uh, for the marathon. Wow. Remember, I'd like you to look at look the history I, I will at the Jenkins orphanage, mm -hmm. Charleston, South Carolina. A lot of people you know and love yeah. either went there or passed through. Right. And Roy Eldridge used to talk about Daniel Jenkins all the time. Yeah. Uh, Lionel Hampton had a trumpet player in the band. He used to always send me messages. He's way ahead of me by 10, 11 years. Tell that boy to keep on playing. His name was uh, Eddie Williams. Line up in the band. Right. He called himself King Ed. And, uh, it's just, Cause they heard about me coming up to the rain. Another trumpet player named was Monk. So they heard about me, and uh, they all passed away now. But it breaks my heart. But that's why when I come to see your room, it just it represents so much more than just your room, mm -hmm. than just your collection. Yeah. It represents a whole lot more than what you have in here. John Levy and I were like this. I knew Joe Williams since 1961. Nancy Wilson, all of them. Mm. Ramsey Lewis, uh, 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 the girl who made Street Life. John Levy managed her too. Jazz Crusaders, he managed. Mm -hmm. Jazz Crusaders. Cannonball Annerley. Cannonball Annerley, his brother Nat. Yeah. And this brings back such deep memory for me. And Joe and Nancy was his prime people. Yeah. Well, 
and now you're part of it. I'm going to suggest that because I want you to have dinner. Oh, really? And I love this better. Before the uh, concert, have some time. It's 30, what time is that? It's, it's 6.30 now. So we can wrap this up and okay. we'll, we'll do part two down the road. Okay, buddy. You know? But I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate that. I've been told also in the last 20 years at least, I've got to write a book. I've got a hell of a book to write. I can write in chapters and yeah. segments I mean, and verify it. Most of what I say, I can verify. Like when I work with Ray Charles and I. Right. Uh, but see, I didn't come here today really to sell me. But, but I could have said all of that, but I didn't. Yeah. I mean, I worked with James Brown. My, my cousin managed James Brown. Um, it's, uh, I can write a book at least that thick and take it in chapters. There's the martial arts world. We can talk about that for a half hour. Martial arts world, my concept of theology, mm -hmm. my concept of criminology. I feel it's different because usually musicians don't go that down, many, down that many roads. Yeah. He's too busy trying to play. All right. So I, 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 I found a way to do all of it. Fantastic. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off for now and we'll thank you very much. Second opportunity. Well, let me thank you very much You're for doing this for me, God bless.